Please give them a round of applause. And um, Hank is going to be presenting his new book, uh, Rooted. Um, I'm just going to briefly uh, introduce Hank before we, we start discussing the, the book itself. So Hank is a Dutch photographer um, and who has developed, I think, a very singular approach to what we might call documentary photography. And uh, the book that we're going to be talking about today is part of an, a very long-term project, um, which I think began in 2005, investigating the issue of illegal immigration um, in Europe, and has led to three different books, of which Rooted is the third, um, in what I think you described as an unintended trilogy. Um, so uh, let me start just by asking you what in the first place back in 2005 drew you to this question of illegal immigration? Um, well, the, the, the project started with an assignment by uh, Medicine Sans Frontières. Um, uh, they, they assigned me to go to Pakistan where a youth earthquake struck. And I'm not a journalistic photographer, uh, I'm a documentary photographer and I was working at that point also as an assign assignment uh, for assignments for magazines. So I, I was doing glossy portraits. With this idea, I was asked to do a, a different kind of view on a, a disaster area. But when I came there, um, it was my first time that I actually saw a refugee camp or saw a big disaster. Um, but the, the NGO expected from me also to, s to take pictures of, you know, like, disaster feeling stuff but the only thing I saw uh, was a lot of resilience so uh, one of the first images I saw was this camp um, uh, from the Red Cross uh, with lots of tents in rows and at one of these rows um, the, immig uh, the, the, uh, the, the victims of the refugees they made it small uh, gardens around their tent in this th they did it that day and when I saw this, it really struck me uh, that, uh, that there was, it, it looked really positive and in, in Holland we call it gezellig. It was almost gezellig, it was cozy. And I never, thought, I never saw something like this in the media because when you talk about um, a disaster, it's always like the victimhood because victims, they sell. Also for NGOs, you need victim pictures to convince people to donate. So I thought, wow, this is interesting. So I went that into the to, to the tents, and then I saw that they were creating small housing uh, or small uh, interiors already with their uh, remaining remaining stuff from their house. They, so when I came home, um, I, I it was my intention to travel around the world uh, to to see in a different way refugee camps. But uh, you need money to travel around the world. And then I saw this small article in the newspaper about um, refugees from Pakistan camping in Calais. So I thought, well, let's close at home, so let's drive up there. And then this, the, the story started. And as, um, as we've been speaking, the images from the book have been um, screened, and we can see that we're not seeing any refugees themselves. So. Um, you're really looking at the environments that they have created for themselves in the context of these refugee camps. And like I said, this is the, the third part, I guess, of, of a study of this, um, this situation, this way of, of life. Um, and so can you tell us a little bit about the, the focus of this specific book about Rooted and, um, and the different areas where, where the book was, uh, was shot? So, <coughs> um, well... The, the approach to, to finally focus on the, on the plants um, was that I, through the whole research period uh, when I, I did the uh, shelter and Ville de Calais, uh, these, these small gardens uh, were always uh, popping up in my uh, thing, so um, in my, my scope. And, uh, but then uh, when I started talking about plants with people, I saw this 
this almost this shock uh, when I approach people like, wow, this is a nice plant, where is it coming from? People were happy that I finally could talk to uh, at some, something else. So then when I finished Field de Calais, I decided to, to really focus on it and just go, and only with the idea of focusing on the plants. Um, uh, so I traveled uh, to places where I knew that there were uh, long-term camps, because that's also one of the... Um, uh, well, uh, you need a camp which is established a little bit because when it's too short, like when people just moving, like f uh, after a few days, they, they're not going to, to put a plant in the ground. But when it's a little settled, then gardens appear. Um, so then the, uh, this investigation started that I started to approach people, ask people, why do you have a plant? Uh, why do you have this garden? And then people started talking and it became more interesting and more interesting and so it developed, yeah. And that, that, um, that idea of people talking is also extremely important in, in the book. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of text that's, um, that is in kind of interwoven into the book itself. And I think one of the fascinating things about your approach is um, that the, the texts are written in a very candid way. Mm -hmm. There is no sort of scientific or journalistic tone. It doesn't feel like you're providing facts or description of a major problem, but it, it feels much more human, mm -hmm. both in terms of the, the people that you are describing, but also in, in being honest about your own feelings, your own experiences. So can you talk about how you developed this, this approach, um, to, to, which is a major part of several of your projects? Yeah. I, always, I never try to judge. That's one that's, um, and it's hard enough. I mean, uh, because uh, in my photography, I try to be as neutral as possible. So I, um, I, I, I ask and I try to avoid all the cliches like uh, disaster or victimhood or whatever. So when you skip all this, um, uh, then you end up with the uh, way I do it, <laughs> I think. so. And there is one, <clears throat> one uh, very important um, uh, aspect as well. I'm dyslectic. So, um, uh, yeah, well, you know, like, uh, so you, uh, because of that, I, I keep it very simple, but I start to appreciate it a lot because I also ch uh, ask in the beginning of my pro uh, process, I asked a, write, a writer to do uh, the writing for me, and every time when I read it, I thought, "No, you know, you're missing the point." You know, like, and, I, and so I, I, at that point, I stepped over my fear of writing and started writing myself, and I started to actually enjoy it. Because before, before that, it was like this horror for me. So that, that's, but you know, like I, I like the the clearness of the, um, uh, so this is what I see, this is what I, uh, what I heard, and this is how I think it is, but I try to keep it honest. And the book is self-published, mm -hmm. um, like your, your previous book, uh, Ville de Calais. Yeah. Um, and, but it is not an, a completely in, um, solo effort. You, you also have this close collaboration with a graphic designer, mm -hmm. um, Robin Ullermann. And can you talk a little bit about that process, about how the two of you work together on, on this book and, and the previous book? Yeah. Well, first of all, I, w I would like to start with uh, what you said. Well, this book is self-published. It's always like, the, uh, people always name it like it's like a big effort that you self-publish. I think not self-publish is really stupid. That's another thing. But I would okay, like... Well, you could develop on that if you, if you want to. I think we've no, got no, a couple no, but, of minutes. No, 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 but I think, I think it's... I, I, I would state something else. I think in the next um, uh, round of, um, of uh, uh, um, awards, uh, we should uh, enter a new subject, and th that's self-designs. I think uh, a photographer, like the winner of the Aperture Award, who self-designs his book, he needs, like, this huge credit for it, because... I'm not a designer, I can't do it. I really need a designer. Um, and this is something which is, in my opinion, often forgotten in, uh, when photographers talk about uh, uh, their photo books. Uh, now it's that it starts to be a little better, but uh, sometimes they totally forget to name their designer. But design is so un unbelievably important to keep the, the story and the narrative across. So in my case, I, I owe a huge uh, uh, amount of uh, gratitude to Robin because he's just this brilliant editor. 
So um, I work with him now almost 10 years. So we did uh, four books, um, a little more, but they're on the side. Um, so we have this collaboration. I, 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 I start to go into a subject. I fill him in with my ideas and my, and then he, his brain is just going, <laughs> and he's um, he's doing his own process, you know. So, and then we talk about it, and then he comes to me, and we talk about it more and more and more, and then I I I just overload him with images, and then I I can't make him more happy that he is just free to do whatever he likes with the images. So. After a month, uh, he comes back with me and totally frustrated most of the times. And then he says, well, I don't know. And then, yes, so this is the process. And then finally, he comes with this brilliant edit. So, but we do it together. But, you know, like the editing process is really his thing. Yeah. Okay, so um, I will hand over to the audience um, if there are some questions for, for Hank about the book about the project. <laughs> yes, so Thank you. <laughs> like me, he's insisting, why is it stupid to not self-publish? Because um, photography books are um, almost a rare object, right? And there are not so many people who actually buy it. So uh, when you are in the field a little bit longer, you basically know all the buyers by name. Uh, you know, like in Holland, uh, I publish in Holland, um, and I know uh, that uh, when, it, when you publish a book in Holland, there are 400 people buying it. That's it. So uh, when you don't have an international audience, there is no point of actually publish more than 500 because you won't sell it as a, as a starting photographer. But in so, you know, like at the end, um, you can do it yourself. Um, um, publishers, they don't make such a, in my opinion, not such a big of effort to actually do more than I would ever do. So I have a distributor, which is very important for the international distribution. And I think it's, um, it's very valuable for me uh, as a photographer and as a self-publisher to actually know the most of the people who buy my books. So they come to, through my website, I have personal contact with them, I can sign it, uh, whatever. And so we keep in contact and then, um, you know, this is the way to do it. And at the end, it saves me a lot of money. Um, because I think it's totally crazy that when you have a, a, a book, you work for for years uh, around the uh, topic, and then you uh, decide to um, to uh, uh, make a book, and you go to a publisher and say, yeah, yeah, great, we're going to make your book, but give me all the money. And then you have to bring like three, 30,000 euros, and you have to say, thank you. Uh, you know, why, you know? So, and then if you're lucky, they give you 50 books, and then you say, oh, wow, I've got 50 books. And you know, I, don't, I don't get the point, you know? So that's why I say self-publish. Well, hopefully none of the publishers downstairs are listening to this talk. <laughs> um, one more question from the audience. So what's your shooting style like? Are you taking lots and lots of pictures all the time or are you carefully planning out each individual shot? Well, I started with a shelter. So when I started in 2005, 6, I, I still uh, took pictures with 4 by 5 inch. So you can imagine, you know, you have to be careful. And then um, in, in 2011, I bought a digital camera, but I still use the style of taking it easy with the amount. But I am... Um, my scope is very specific, so I, I only want to do, well, certain images, so I leave a lot of other stuff. So I'm, I'm not a crazy photographer, no. no. Do we have one more question? All right, so, so how, do you, how do you gain the trust of your, of your subjects, in, given the context, and how do you approach them? 
Well, you know, like, again, when, you're, when you have an honest story, so I'm really interested in why they have, like, these gardens and why they have their plants. People are happy to tell you because, you know, like, uh, when, you, when, when you get positive attention, you know, you feel happy. So this is a human feeling. And so everybody's having it. So when you have the good intentions, it's, people appreciate it. And one thing you asked, but I forgot to uh, answer about, uh, there's, there's hardly any portraits in, the, in my work. And so I started off as a portrait photographer, and uh, I decided to not focus on the persons the, uh, in the physical sense anymore. So uh, this also helped me, because I was not, not interested in, in, in their face uh, uh, but only the, the, I was interested in what they created, uh, what they were standing for. And this helped uh, uh, a lot. Um, and I, I skipped the portraits um, deliberately because I didn't want to, um, to give the impression that I actually understand, understand what is going on with these people. So with f portrait photography, it's like, there is this mutual understanding, I, you know, and I don't believe in it personally because I don't, you know, I, I can never stand in their footsteps. So I didn't want to, to raise the impression. That's why I moved away from the portraits. Okay, thank you so much, Hank. Right. And um, uh, Hank will be doing a, a signing at Off Print at um, 5 p.m. at the Idea Books table. And for those of you that haven't seen the book, um, there, the book was also nominated for the Book of the Year Award. Um, sadly, it didn't win, but it was a worthy nominee. And you can see a copy of the book downstairs in the display of the, um, of the books. So thank you again, Hank.